Over to you, Mark. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Mo Blaker, the chair of the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crime, a prevention platform, and I'm extremely pleased to welcome you all to this webinar, The Rohingya Crisis in Myanmar, a genocide incited on, on Facebook. This is actually the third session on the Decoding Hate Speech online series co-organized by the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies, MIX, and the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes, GAMAC, to bring together leading voices to discuss the linkages between hate speech, technology, and atrocity prevention. Today, the crisis in Myanmar stands out as a case study of groups harnessing social media to incite violence and of the failure of social media platforms to take actions. What role did online speech, hate speech and misinformation play in the resurgence of oppression and human rights violations? What are the lessons learned from this crisis for all stakeholders, be it the big tech, state, civil society, to prevent this from happening again? This third session of the Decoding Hate Speech series we are focused on the weaponization of social media in Myanmar. It will also examine the role that online hate speech and misinformation played in the severe human rights violations and address whether this case marks a turning point in big tech's realization that they must consider the human rights impact of their platforms. It shall also explore the lessons learned from this case study to prevent this from happening again. Our very distinguished panelists today are Senator Marilou McFedran of Canada, Grant Shubin, Legal Director of the Global Justice Center, Mia Tu, Independent Expert and Research Advisor at Myanmar Tech Accountability, with the excellent facilitation, as usual, of our dear Kyle Mathieu, Executive Director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies, MIX. He will moderate the event. We hope you find the discussion very useful. Please do use the chat function to engage with one another and also with the speakers. And let us know also where you, where you are, uh, from where you are listening. Uh, share your questions to our panelists and make us recommendations. Thank you. I wish you a very enlightening and useful session. Thank you very much. Uh, Kyle, back to you. Thank you, Mo. Um, Mo, it's always a, a pleasure to work with you as, as a representative uh, of the Swiss Foreign Ministry and as chair of GAMAC and your leading role in, in putting together GAMAC, which is a, a very important international institu institution organization dealing with mass trust prevention. So we're very pleased to work with you again and, and thank you for your support in putting the series together. Um, um, the case of the Rohingya, um, the genocide against the Rohingya, the ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya has been one of the most serious cases of mass atrocity crimes that we've seen in contemporary times in the past decade. Um, we've seen over um, oh, upwards of 700,000 Rohingya Muslim civilians that have fled to Bangladesh um, that are still living in very precarious situations, uh, that are living in very uh, substandard refugee camps that um, whose future is up in the air. And we have also Rohingya Muslims that are that are in parts of uh, Myanmar that still are living under extremely difficult situations. So we thought that this this topic of looking at, at the case of the Rohingya is, 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 is very important, uh, but it's also very contemporary and there are lessons learned about what we can do. And I think the real case about this thing today and our experts are gonna delve into, what's the role of the incitement element of genocide? of a mass atrocities. Uh, we do have seen that the incitement component really did take place on Facebook. The Facebook was the internet for the majority of um, Myanmar citizens. And we've also had cases of Buddhist monks using Facebook to incite hate. Um, we've had even uh, government officials engaging on this. So this is a very important topic and, and lessons learned and it's contemporary. It, 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 the case is not over. There are still many of us working to try to bring about a resolution to this uh, human rights crisis. So we're very pleased to, today to have three very distinguished speakers. Mo introduced them all, um, so I won't introduce you, uh, but we're really happy to have you 
uh, all join us today. And so how we're going to start off, we have a set of questions I'd like to ask the guests, but first we're going to ask each guest to make an opening statement. They've all been working on this from different perspectives, from working in Myanmar itself, uh, from working for a, a major global justice uh, think tank and NGO in New York City, and we have Senator McFedrin working at the Canadian Senate, and we know that in Canada there's been a lot of action um, uh, to try to halt the atrocities in Myanmar. So first I would like to uh, go in the order, starting with Senator McFedrin, and ask Senator McFedrin if you could please, please talk about this issue and, and how you see it through your lens as a, as a, as a senator in, in, in Canada. Kyle, I want to thank you very much for this invitation and just do a sound check. Everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Good. All right. It's a real honor to be on this panel with Mo and Grant and Mia. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make, I guess, a, a primary point as my contribution to starting the discussion. And, and that is that we really have to get serious at understanding the many ways in which there is a far too cozy and codependent relationship between tech giants like Facebook and governments. And we have to, in doing that, as legislators, I would say, one of the things we have to pay attention to, although I am an independent senator with no partisan affiliation, it is very clear if one looks at Facebook in country after country after country, including Myanmar, that in many cases, Facebook and, and uh, government support teams, communication support people in Facebook really become de facto campaign workers. And the reliance of governments in their regular political activities on Facebook probably contributes very substantially to the slow or negligible, and one could argue negligent, responses by government in getting ahead of the Facebook pandemic of hate speech. And I want to also just note warnings in my own country, in Canada, we can go all the way back to 2009, when our privacy commissioner at the time issued a report, called out Facebook specifically for violations, and um, unfortunately didn't proceed any further at that time. So now, 11 years later, we are hearing from government officials in Canada that we need to look more closely at, quote, regulating Facebook, which means we still haven't done it. And the way in which we need to do that is not only to look at the privacy concerns, which are very serious of Canadians, but to look at the um, fact that there are no boundaries. That something that happens in Canada can be uh, perpetrated and expanded in any other country in the world. And that the way in which the, regulation, the regulatory powers are within, in many cases, the boundaries of countries simply don't match the global citizen, global reach reality of tech giants. And on the topic of warnings, I just want to put this in context. We heard in 2014 and again in 2015 from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zayd al Hussein, that the UN Special Rapporteur at the time, Yang He Li, had gone on an official visit to Myanmar and was actively insulted with sexist remarks undermining the fact that she was there on an official visit, which means she couldn't have been there without the agreement of the government of Myanmar. And that this, this kind of warning to the UN Human Rights Council eventually led in 2017-18 to the UN Independent Investigative Fact-Finding Mission, which reported back that there were definite um, indications that Facebook was being used actively to perpetrate hate speech and some of which had genocidal intent. Um, but we also know that from speeches and remarks posted on Facebook, uh, 
that the Tatmadaw commander in chief said very explicitly that the so called attacks, um, and there were certainly some, that generated the massive response, including sexualized violence, um, burnings, horrible, horrible crimes against humanity, were a massive backlash that in no way matched. Um, what was done on behalf of, of the Rohingya. And yet we have the chief commander posting that what happened was unfinished job of dealing with the Bengali problem. No, no consequences for that. At page 74 of that report in 2018 to the Human Rights Council, the fact-finding mission said categorically that um, Facebook was slow and ineffective. Now we know that the fact-finding mission gave way to the independent investigative mechanism that is still headed by Nicholas Kumjian. And in his reports, it started in the fall of 2019, he noted that this time the mechanism has no end date. And he also reminded the council that um, just previous in that year, that the special tribunal um, for the Khmer Rouge um, genocide in Cambodia had convicted um, for genocide a number of the commanders of the Khmer Rouge. And so to his point, um, there is no end date, there will be watching, there will be accountability. But that was really addressed to officials in Myanmar who can be brought to account through our existing international legal system. None of that applies to the tech giants. None of that applies to Facebook. And so governments, legislators, we have a particular conundrum here and it has to start with acknowledging and taking responsibility for the cozy relationship that is probably one of the major factors that is leading to the fact that we have basically done nothing that's effective. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator McFedrin, for, for a pretty detailed analysis of, of the problems that, that democracies are facing in trying to regulate these giant tech platforms. And you also highlighted the transnational element of it in which whatever happens in one country doesn't stay in the other. And, and you gave examples where the UN is citing um, the use of Facebook as a tool uh, for incitement to violence and of, um, of perhaps genocidal intent. So I think this is, this is fascinating and, and we have to grapple onto that. But before we go into more detail, I would like now to ask uh, Grant Shubin to um, take the floor and provide some introductory uh, statements. Thank you, Kyle. And uh, it's also sound check, making sure everyone can hear me. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Kyle. And thank you to Migs and Gamak for hosting this incredibly timely event. It's really an honor to be able to talk about it with uh, my esteemed co-panelists. And I want to talk about uh, the ways that in which Facebook posts played a role in the gender-based persecution uh, that occurred in Myanmar. And specifically, I'd like to shed light on how Facebook posts integrated misogyny and sexism in a way that provided the foundation for certain types of attacks against the Rohingya. And to start to do that, it's important to understand the broader narrative that those posts created that led to the othering and dehumanization of the Rohingya. Because one thing we know from other mass atrocities is that massive scale violence occurs when the othering of a group makes the leap from being merely rhetorical to being physical. And of course, the starting place of this type of extreme othering is a focus on identity, which was very much a feature of the Facebook posts leading up to the atrocities against the Rohingya. By and large, those posts showed an obsessive fixation on identity. They were heavily invested in fantasies of the superiority of the Bamar identity, and by extension, the inferiority of the Rohingya. And one very common example of this was the widespread use of the term Kalar to describe the Rohingya on Facebook. 
And this term generally being used as a racist slur or an insult to a person's dark skin or foreign ancestry, ancestry, signifying their perceived inferiority compared to ethnicities that quote unquote belong in Myanmar. And this type of racial hierarchy is seen in many free atrocity societies, including Nazi Germany, Slobodan Milosevic's yeah. Serbia, Rwanda's Hutu power, Daesh's caliphate, or of course the Tatmadaw's Myanmar. And in Myanmar, like these other situations, this hierarchy of identities led to calls for the inferior group to be destroyed in order to save the superior group from overtaking, from being overtaken. And on Facebook, this meant that there were posts that openly called for the destruction of the Rohingya as a necessary step to save Myanmar from infiltration. So for example, in 2016, a well-known a well-known media personality posted about how the Rohingya were, quote, a common enemy that was invading Myanmar. And this post had over 830 comments, many calling for the uprooting of the Rohingya, their, their eradication, uh, and generally describing the situation in Rakhine State as a, quote, Muslim invasion. Another post on the official Facebook page of the commander in chief included a link that described Islam as a, quote, disease spreading globally and that, quote, Muslims were attempting to Islamize the whole world. And elsewhere on the commander's Facebook page, there was a post that stated that race cannot be swallowed by the ground, but only by another race. And what you see here was something that was outlined by the fact-finding mission, the, the UN fact-finding mission in Myanmar, which determined that the hate speech campaign portrayed the Rohingya and other Muslims as an existential threat to Myanmar and to Buddhism. And this theme of an existential threat was propped up by several narratives, including narratives that played into long-standing anti-Muslim prejudices and stereotypes. One, sub one such stereotype was about Rohingya reproduction. A central feature to the Facebook posts about the a Rohingya invasion centered on descriptions of population growth among the Rohingya. And these quotes describe alleged incontrollable birth rates among the Rohingya or that the Rohingya quote bred like ant rabbits or that they had extremely large families. And this preoccupation with Rohingya reproduction shows how bigotries on Facebook were laced with patriarchal assumptions about reproduction. And it is here where we can see how Facebook posts and their extremely gendered narratives of Rohingya reproduction seeded the specific forms of violence that were ultimately meted out against Rohingya women and girls. And so in other words, by defining Rohingya as an enemy that threatened to overpopulate Myanmar, the prevailing hate speech on Facebook provided a fame framework that made sexual and gender-based violence attacks against the Rohingya a consequence of the problem as that hate speech defined it. Which is to say that the obsession on Rohingya reproduction led to a si situation where certain types of violence was expressive of the mission that the mil Myanmar military saw itself completing. Indeed, the massive scale violence and barbarity of the violence carried out against Rohingya women and girls reflected the misogyny of this hate speech, which itself was built upon deeply ingrained and pre-existing bigotries. In the so-called clearance operations, Myanmar's military targeted women and girls of reproductive age because of their collective and their socially constructed responsibility for Rohingya reproduction. And not only were these women targeted, but they were targeted in a way that responded directly to the gendered implications of an obsession on Rohingya fertility. Specifically, the Myanmar FFM uh, described widespread and systematic selection of women and girls of reproductive age for rape, attacks on pregnant women and babies, mutilation of their reproductive organs, physical branding of their bodies by bite marks on their cheeks, necks, or other parts of their body, or so severely injuring these women and girls that they would be unable to have sexual intercourse or unable to have children. And these gendered attacks stand at a crossroads of hatred directed towards the group and misogyny. And when committed against women and girls, these attacks were crimes, again, again against the Rohingya, but they're also crimes against these individuals on the basis of their sex. And of course, sexual and gender-based violence is by no means unique to the Myanmar situation. And there are lots of examples of misogynistic hate speech fueling gender-based attacks. But what is unique about Myanmar was that much of this gendered hate speech for the first time happened on social media. But what does this all mean? How can this be useful to Facebook or other social media companies that are trying to prevent atrocities in the future? 
And more than anything, I think it means that a full and gendered understanding of the hate speech precursors to mass atrocities can shed light on what meaningful preventative measures are. And obviously these measures need to kick in before there's a serious risk of mass atrocities, which requires education on the dangers of identity-based politics or fixations on matters of identity in general. It also requires being alert to the devaluation and dehumanization of groups in society that are vulnerable to marginalization. And when it comes to women and girls, uh, it demands identifying and eroding the pre-existing structures that tolerate gender-based violence and more generally gender equality. Because if pre-existing structures of patriarchy and dem gender domination can contribute to massive scale violence in the way that we see it, saw, have seen in Myanmar, then social media companies must at the very least understand and avoid amplifying posts that promote treatment of human beings as, of human beings as objects and support and incite gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you, Grant, for um, that detailed analysis of the role of uh, misogyny um, and, and identity and how it occurred online and how it led to um, offline violence. I think it's and, and particularly about some of the things you mentioned about the attacks and, and marking and mutilating. We're seeing that in, in a lot of the scholarly work and we know some Canadians working on this issue. So that's that's very important. And I hope, I hope later we can have a discussion also among others about what were some of the problems about Facebook? They didn't have enough Burmese content moderators reading or that their artificial intelligence or algorithms couldn't detect a lot of the memes and the videos and the cartoons inciting hate, not just words, but other aspects of, of Facebook's platform that, that clearly didn't work. So so I think that's fascinating and thank you. And now I would like to to turn to, to Miat too. Uh, you're in Myanmar, you're, you're working with a lot of um, Myanmar activists and tech people. So uh, Miat too, the floor is yours. And I, I think you also want to try to share a screen. So we're going to hope that we can make that happen. So let me try to share my screen. Uh, share screen. Oh, yeah, we're gonna oh, put it on now, one sec. Screen. Yes. Yes, I did. Now it's work. So thanks kind for giving me a chance to speak this event and thanks everyone who are involved in the panel with me. So it's really a powerful insight I hear, hear from you. So well, before I start uh, talking about the rules of Facebook in, uh, in the genocide, so I would like to start about the little bit background. So you will see my chart. There, there is like, I, I take this from the quest.com. So this is the, about the, the, how to say, the the Sinka price in Burma and uh, before the 2014, the Sinka price are uh, more than like uh, the more than a 1,000. So that only a few people have a uh, like a uh, have a chance to get uh, uh, their own communication. So start from like uh, 20. We are under the uh, military leadership like uh, more than 50 years. So during this period, they are really screwing the censorship, and we started releasing in 2014. So uh, the, we, we have a lack of experience about the uh, digital uh, rather than the other country. So there is like a, what well, one, like a, we are started using Facebook, the, the main challenge that we are facing is everything is really uh, new for us. And also we are thinking uh, all of the things we are seeing on the internet real. And also like as Kai mentioned, that uh, the Facebook is like a de facto internet in Myanmar. So, so there is like a, we are uh, facing the background. So it, before the 2012, it, that, that to get a, a sync care is really difficult for the each family. So after this 2014, we just started using the same a lot and we started using the internet a lot. So uh, this is like uh, the, the, the situation of like uh, the developing of the Facebook in Myanmar. So we started, most of uh, the urban people started using Facebook around 2012. So in 20, uh, 2012, 2013 and 2014, so there is only one content moderator on Facebook. So in 2014, we have 1 million Facebook user uh, and there's only one content moderator. So, and then these people are based in Dublin and uh, it's showing like uh, he, they, 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 these people, uh, we don't know who they actually, like uh, what kind of skill he actually had. And also like uh, the, the, how to say the, the, about the contextual understanding as well. 
And in 2014, uh, like uh, during this time, 2012 to 2014, everything is static. The Rakhine, like uh, the situation, the Rakhine crisis is started on 2012 May, in, uh, like uh, about the rate case issue. And also the crisis happened in uh, Northern Rakhine. In 2013, we have a uh, two uh, crises. One is mid Obama, Metila crisis. There's more than 100 like, uh, people are fleeing from their home. And uh, most of them are staying in the camp. And also the, the, the conflict is affecting to the Bako region, it's next to Yango. And also the in 2014, uh, and we have a crisis in Lashu and Mandalay. The Mandalay crisis is 100% uh, related with Facebook because of Mandalay crisis happened because of the fake news by the monk uh, who are, are living in Mandalay and he posted about the fake rig case of the uh, Muslim shop owner and Buddhist seller. After that, the crisis happened, uh, two people died in the crisis and government started shut down Facebook for one day. After that, Facebook started coming to Myanmar. Uh, in 2015, uh, before the FISO never came to Myanmar, uh, and in 2015, FISO hired four quantum moderators for Myanmar. In 20, like, uh, and like uh, at the time, we have a uh, uh, more than no, uh, we have around seven million users in 2015. So in 2016, we have 10 million users. In 2017, we have 15 million users. The 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 number of quantum moderators are the stay the same. So during this period of time. Uh, like uh, there is no clue when we are trying to report something. This like uh, the, the 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 report is going nowhere. Sometimes it's like a letter contest, and it's like uh, when we trying to report whatever we trying to report is like uh, it is in they they reply is in line with community standard because of they don't have a net control monitor for this kind of user. So in, in 2018 around April, the in April uh, the civil society. The organizing the open letter to face so, and also the uh, trying to uh, the civil society trying to advocate the US Congress before they hear they make a Congress hearing to the Mark Zuckerberg. And during this Congress hearing, Zuckerberg promised to hire more quantum monitor for Myanmar and he started hiring dozens of quantum monitor at the end of 2018. There's just around like a 99 and quantum monitor who can speak Palmish language. At that time we have 20 million users. Now we have 27 million Facebook users, and there is more than 160 content moderators we have. We know that number because we try we try to ask Facebook through a lot of channels, through the Congress, through the uh, through the media, and also or oh, during the event we are always trying to oh, ask Facebook about the how many content moderators they hire for Myanmar. So this net kind of number are really important for like a. How much Facebook are working, like uh, taking responsibility for their platform, and what is their plan for our, our moderation? So that kind of stuff. So yeah, this is the timeline we are using Facebook. So and before the 2017, when the 2017 uh, happened, uh, like uh, there is like uh, a lot of like, uh, uh, incitement posts on Facebook, especially a, like like a pro to propaganda the the public about the to make a negative propaganda to the public about the Rohingya. So, like, uh, the, but well, if we want to talk about the propaganda against the Rohingya, we, we should not start around 2012. It's already started since 1970. So, like, uh, this always, uh, the government's always framing, like, uh, the Rohingya are invaders. They are, like, uh, they are from the other country. They are trying, they are just, like, uh, trying to Islamize the country. That kind of stuff we are, we hear since, like, when we are young. So the propaganda is that the same like this, but like uh, the, the the real thing we are facing is Facebook is like a megaphone. You know, the better they are using the Facebook to amplify their voice, and they 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 they, they are like a, it's really no cost, little no cost to them, and it's really rich, more than like a, when before they trying to make a propaganda against Rohingya, they they what they have to publish a lot of posts, but like in Facebook, it's really easy. They they just make a post and they just. They just using like uh, the fake account to share into the multi bag group. Also, they share into the messenger. Sometimes they make a like a carton. So let me show some example. So this is in 2013. We I take this screenshot from uh, this. I take this screenshot from uh, one. This page is the one of the cluster from the uh, Facebook takedown uh, uh, during this year. 
uh, Facebook uh, say things that these uh, kind of network are just financially motivated and, uh, in order, so they lay down as an inauthentic behavior. So these uh, these pages are making a uh, Islam uh, like a propaganda to the uh, about the Islamization in 2013. So that kind of things we are seeing since 2012, 2013, 2014, 15, very frequently. Now most of them got taken down by Facebook. So to, uh, this is like uh, out of 2016, uh, one like uh, the other first attacks happening. So that the, 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 these pages are also uh, part of the now what. Uh, and also at the time they are making like a, you know, they trying to incite the violence, you know, we can store, we need to do a clearing operation. If we don't do this, the Rakhine people are uh, like a get in trouble under the Islamization. So in, in like a, this is in the 2017, in 2016, the first attack. So after that, the kind of Islamization propaganda are still continue. And also in August 2017, when the crisis is happening, you know, they, they trying to manipulate the the public, you know, they said like uh, there, we are under the terrorist attack. The all of the uh, the government are also on the same page with the military. So the issue that the 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 green light is on, we can do whatever we want to protect our country. That kind of scenario they are planning. And also, you know, in 2017, they are not just stopping with the Rohingya. At the same time, they try also do the same thing into the Myanmar Muslim who are living in the the uh, Rangon, Mandalays, and other. So th this is the post I take this from the same Nawa. and they they said like uh, he has a list of dangerous mosques in Yangon, and they trying to they 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 trying to ins like uh, they trying to incite the public to 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 make an attack into these uh, mosques. So that kind of things uh, happened during that time, and you know at that time we don't have a net kind of moderator and other, but like uh, it is already violated on the face of policy, but uh, there's no clue to take down at that time so not just using the uh, not just using that kind of uh, like a normal incitement they are also promoting the hate speech cartoon and the other or with the app as well you know so the, this i take this screenshot personally take this this screenshot around like uh, the september so they they, they are posting like uh, the, the, the 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 illegal bengali are coming and then that the, the, this is showing the activists that the activists are don't face and activists are run. When the man can patriot are coming, so the activists and others are there, like uh, they're trying to get them, like uh, they get the, the man. So they, he trying to frame like that kind of way. But according to the face of policy, they are not allowed that kind of content. But like a uh, lack of enforcement, they allow that kind of content into their platform. So, and also uh, right now, the face are really getting more improved than the past two years. Now they have 160 kind of moderator and they also do a lot of good job during this uh, election time. They are actively like a one, uh, someone trying to escalate, they trying to oh, enforce, but that's not a net. They really need to improve their system as well. It's not just about like a policy. So because of like a, in here, uh, they they are uh, they announced their rem uh, the removing coordinator and then the behavior on out of eight. So inside this report, they are like uh, talking about the the military cluster who are coordinated and uh, working the uh, coordinated in authentic way. So these pages are from this report. So this like uh, they trying to show that these pages are the from the military. But like uh, uh, less like uh, 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 the at the end of October. So uh, I take this screenshot from Facebook. So the same pages are coming back with the sponsor. And the, the, the caption say to protest race and religion. So Facebook is no clue to stop that kind of things. The bad actor, they can use, they, 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 they use like the weakness of the Facebook system and they constantly come in back and also they constantly propaganda, whatever Facebook take down. So the, the thing Facebook should do is to fix their system, you know, not being manipulated or not being weaponized by bad actor. They definitely need to oh, do that kind of step not just a policy thing and not just a PR thing. So that kind of thing we, they have to do. And also they definitely need to continue working on investigation because like uh, the, in, in Myanmar, the hate speech is not coming from the individual. It's coming from like a very coordinated way. So the removing one pool is not solving the problem. It's like uh, the, 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 the actor, they intentionally create that account and they constantly coming back, whatever face will take it down or not. They constantly coming back, and then like a Facebook just removing one post by one post and one post, and you know that the crisis happened. 
So that kind of stuff we are facing. Yeah, so I would like to share about that kind of stuff and I am uh, I, I'm happy to get your feedback and answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Miat, for that detailed conversation. Um, I think three things stood out for me in your comments. One is that you you mentioned some of the propaganda uh, or or hate against um, the Rohingya didn't just start this decade. It, it has a longer history. Um, yeah. and I think that's important to put that into context. But you yeah. also highlighted that you know Myanmar was a closed society for quite some time, and and what we've seen with the sale of these SIM cards, you see an explosion of citizens being able to access outside information. And yeah. you also highlighted um, how Facebook went from 1 million to 27, 27 million users with a very small amount of content moderators, which shows that the program, and, I, and I, I, one last point before we go to the next questions, my colleagues and I, we, we, we did a report for Global Affairs Canada on online hate and artificial intelligence. And we found in Myanmar that a lot of Facebook's algorithms were deleting video evidence of atrocities against the Rohingya because their algorithms thought that they were inciting hate speech, but they were human rights activists getting digital information for eventual prosecution or to bring it to uh, the International Court of Justice. So clearly there are some issues of platform governance around Facebook that we can take lessons from, uh, from the Myanmar case, definitely. Um, I would now, um, I have a few questions. I know there's questions in the audience, but I'm gonna pose each of our panelists, starting with um, Senator McFedrin. A senator, um, in September, you wrote that you would be boycotting Facebook in solidarity with the Global Network of Women's Peace Builders for allowing online hate that can lead to offline violence. You also gave an extensive list of Facebook's inactions in other countries. In your view, what can Canada and other states do specifically to push social media companies to regulate content of their platforms? Well, Cal, I, I think it comes down to those of us whose job it is to legislate um, and to protect and promote human rights. Um, we need to get busy and do our job. Um, we're lacking a regulatory framework that seems to have any effectiveness whatsoever, even in a privileged democracy like Canada. And the ways in which we are, as a country, trying to address the genocide in Myanmar um, includes direct um, international development, extensive international development funding that is consistent with our feminist foreign policy. It includes a commitment for us to intervene in the um, International Court of Justice case that's ongoing where the Gambia has challenged Myanmar under the Genocide Convention. There are um, a number of ways in which we have already taken action. Um, our government has taken action and um, none of them at this point have actually really tackled the reality of tech giants and the way in which social media is entwined completely in our political system. And I, I think that it, it really does come down to that, that um, parliamentarians in Canada have to move this up the priority list. The last time, um, based on, on my search, and I, I stand to be corrected, but my search uh, for statements by cabinet ministers in the Canadian government that something was going to be done goes all the way back to early 2019. Um, and and it's, it's now uh, November of 2020. So we've got a, a gap in terms of responsiveness and um, we as parliamentarians need to move that up and Thank close you, that gap. Thank uh, you, Senator McFedrin. Um, I know that MIGS is willing to work with you to help push this agenda. We've worked with the all-party parliament group for the prevention of genocide um, and put out a report on the role of technology and atrocity prevention. And there were some of these elements and, and we're, we really think it has to be put up to the um, to a higher level. So, um, so we really appreciate your comments. Um, I would like to ask Grant uh, now. Um, Grant, the rise of the internet has led to new challenges in terms of hate speech and violent extremism, exacerbating the gender roles and gender power dynamics. 
How should national and international laws respond to these new problems, in particular, in addressing masculinities to counter violent extremism? Sorry, masculinities of violent to counter violent extremism. Sure, I, I think that the, you know, I, I it, it, the international framework in, in in international human rights treaties, specifically looking at CDOD are pretty robust and sophisticated in articulating the ways in which uh, national governments, national jurisdictions, uh, local jurisdictions can begin to approach this issue. And I think that the, the way that, they, that CEDA and, and other human rights bodies recommend that this happen is by affecting more generally gender equality. And by doing that both as a matter of policy, but also by integrating it into certain of a country's legal framework. And looking specifically at, at Myanmar, I think that that can happen in any number of ways. Uh, the most obvious of which is to update certain aspects of Myanmar's broader legal framework to reflect uh, uh, gender equality more holistically as it's understood in 2020. And specifically, that can be by uh, passing uh, a prevention of violence against women law, which has been uh, in, in the parliament for some time. As it exists now, uh, the Myanmar criminal, Myanmar's criminal code goes back, I believe, I, to the mid 1800s. I can't, I can't remember the specific year, but it's a, it's a, um, a vestige of the colonial UK law and it goes back to that and many of the uh, specific uh, uh, articles in that law read as if they come from the 1800s uh, specifically relating to uh, certain crimes of sexual violence and more generally speaking to gender roles that uh, existed at the time and it's time for national governments, specifically for Myanmar, to begin to shed those gender roles to to reflect uh, uh, gender equality and an understanding of uh, of the equality of women and men and of sexual uh, people of diverse sexual orientations and gender identities as we understand it uh, in 2020. And I think by doing this omnibus review of of policy and specifically of legislation, you can begin to affect gender equality. And by affecting gender equality, you can then begin to erode the, the pressures put on uh, people who are want to, to uh, subscribe to a violent extremist ideology. Uh, and you can begin to reduce those pressures uh, uh, on the society. Thank you. Kyle, could yeah. I jump in and just add an, an, an additional point please, to please the do. very the very good points that, that Grant just raised. And again, I'm speaking more from a, a governmental perspective. If we don't significantly up our game country to country to country in sharing the kind of regulatory approaches that we need to bring in, then again, you know, we're playing in silos. We're not responding to the practical reality that we live in a global world where a lot of those country boundaries and country laws just are not going to be effective enough. And the other point I wanted to make, building on, on Grant's point, and also what Miat brought to our discussion in a, his excellent presentation, is that there are many human rights activists in Myanmar. Um, and some are in Myanmar, some have had to flee Myanmar, but those that are still in Myanmar and are not necessarily of a, a minority group are also very much at risk. And a number of our countries, certainly Canada, we are funding through our feminist foreign policy international development, a number of Canadian NGOs and agencies that are working to support the promotion of human rights inside Myanmar to try and undo some of the hugely anti-democratic um, influences of, in particular, the military. And this is a whole area that I think um, we can look at more closely. How is it that we can better support the kind of protection and regulation that's needed inside Myanmar as countermeasures for the hugely inappropriate use and exploitation um, by the dominant Tatmadaw and, and other dominant players in Myanmar society. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So I'd like to um, 
Miat will probably want to, to respond to that, but I'm going to ask Miat also another question and you can answer both or just one. <laughs> It's up to you, but um, you, I'd like to ask you, you know, how has Facebook responded to the gaps that have been identified and have you seen any results recently? Um, particularly, I know we just had elections in Myanmar. H have you seen any changes to the gaps in Facebook's uh, program and, and is it getting worse or getting better? Facebook is getting better now. Uh, when we like uh, compare with 2017 and 2018 and right now that the, the situation is completely different in 2017 and 2018 they are not really interested whatever we see and whatever we trying to rise to to face the problem right now is they are uh, becoming better so like a, like a, like a, now we are facing the the same issue we are facing in face in 2018 uh, around 2017 18 is we are facing the same with the youtube and data especially the youtube so now now but at her they are moving youtube for their propaganda so uh like uh, they are their hosted platform is youtube is now becoming like uh, their hosted platform for the hate speech and also the military propaganda and the like uh, also the propaganda against genocide to the rohingya so that kind of things are moving to facebook so now our we are uh, facing a problem with Facebook to uh, face face with, facing with the problem with the YouTube and uh, uh, yes we uh, we are really a, a huge, uh, facing a huge challenges how to uh, like uh, how to make YouTube more responsible and accountable accountable for their platform uh, to make an enforcement uh, about their to make an enforcement for their platform being better for the our community. So yes, so now what I can say now is uh, Facebook, uh, like the duration is becoming, the Facebook duration is becoming better than the past, but they still need to improve, especially on the uh, systematic. Like uh, now they are like uh, the reviewing system, especially their enforcement are not really doing enough. So they are still missing a lot of a lot of things. So they really need to improve, especially uh, on the con uh, contextual level, understanding level, they have to improve as well not just a, uh, uh, like a product and the other. So uh, uh, the, if I, uh, I like the, the, the question from the Senator is I like a, the, about like a, how like a, the international community can do better for Myanmar, right? Is that correct or? Hello? Yes. Yeah. So yes, the, the uh, yeah the, the lack of now we are facing the the, the lack of democratic value uh, is happening across the country. So like uh, the in during this election, the the all of the party uh, and also the party supporter, they are using the hate speech against the Rohingya uh, to to get uh, the uh, to gain the uh, political support from the public. So they are used like uh, they like uh, the USDB supporter. They say like uh, the the NRD is a Muslim and party. They are promoting the Rohingya. Uh, they use the word Bengali. They are promoting their Bengali body, that kind of stuff. And also the NRD supporter. They are using the photo of the Muslim uh, the Muslim and uh, USDB member. And they said like uh, the the NRD is not a pro Muslim. That uh, just the 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 USDB is the Bengali party that they are the pro Muslim party that kind of stuff it's not just these two party but also like the new party the PPP people pioneer party they are also using the same narrative to uh, they, they they are promoting the uh, anti Rohingya narrative as an official for their to get uh, to gain the political support from the public so that kind of stuff we are facing so I think uh, I'm a truly support uh, truly suggest to do uh, education reform for our country. Uh, we need a democratic education for our country future. So because like like uh, the current ed uh, education system is full with propaganda and also really uh, xenophobic. So they are we are learning not just like uh, from the we are getting like a uh, propaganda or like uh, against the minority, especially the the other religious. It's not just coming from the the like uh, uh, the bad actor. It's also coming from the system as well. We're facing the systematic discrimination. It's a structural violence. So we definitely need to change the education system. I fully recommend on it. And also not just uh, like uh, the the workshop and training, but I mean like the education reform for the whole education system. This is really important. And also our country really need to be 
a a like a uh, uh, the the how to say the reform the as inside the 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 political uh, body. So we now is like uh, the people are not really talking about the value. Uh, they are just make, uh, mostly the political politician are mostly trying to follow the public and also the, to get the public in the popular support. So they are using the religious as a political narrative. They are using the the anti Rohingya narrative as a uh the, for the political support that kind of stuff we are facing so yeah we definitely need to change that so long-term saturation is the to change the education thank you miat so i'm going to take questions from the audience because we have about 10 or 11 minutes left it's gone quite quickly so i'm going to put this up on the screen uh deba priya Mukherjee asks is there a way to make facebook accountable for letting people use this as a platform of inciting violence I mean, is it possible to add Facebook as a respondent in the litigation before the International Court of Justice? Not sure who of our guests would like to take, uh, try to try to talk with this. Anybody would like to respond? Yeah, I can. Uh, I can take a stab at it. Um, I mean, I think the the first question is the million dollar question, really, and that's uh, what is the relationship of national governments to law enforcement agencies? to social media platforms and specifically where is the where does the freedom of speech is it necessarily infringed to prevent incitement to mass atrocity crimes and that's the conversation i think that uh, this entire series of of um, of webinars is investigating and it's still very much a live question and an important question uh, traditionally speaking there's no way to hold Facebook account accountable in existing international criminal mechanisms or international or in the International Court of Justice. So the reason that Facebook can't be added as a respondent to the litigation before the ICJ is because the ICJ is a uh, is a court that only hears disputes between states uh, in the in the type of case that's currently going on in the ICJ. So uh, not only can only states be brought before that court. But this particular litigation is happening under the Genocide Convention and states that are parties to the Genocide Convention. And it happens to be that Myanmar and the Gambia are parties to the Genocide Convention. So there's not an opportunity to explicitly bring Facebook to have to answer in a legal proceeding before the, the justices of the International Court of Justice. However, I am hopeful that the role of Facebook can be fleshed out in that litigation. And that was partly why I took the time to go through the ways that gender formed such an important part of the incitement of the of, of the genocide occurring in Myanmar and how that led to certain crimes of sexual and gender-based violence. Because I think that whether it's the Gambia or whether it's Canada in their intervention or whether it's the Netherlands in their intervention, it's important to understand and for and, and for there to be an articulation of Facebook was used or hate speech was used on Facebook in this very specific way to other and ostracize the Rohingya community that that provided the seeds for a particular type of genocidal violence, in this case, sexual and gender-based violence occurring against the Rohingya more generally and specifically against women and girls. And if that type of argument is made before the ICJ and if it's picked up in the, the decision, that's going to cause repercussions and reverberations in Facebook because that's not going to be good uh, publicity for Facebook. And so that's why I think it's really important for the gendered understanding of this Facebook, of the, the hate speech and more generally an understanding of this hate speech as it occurred in Myanmar to be, uh, to be articulated in ongoing processes such that it can create the pressure uh, for Facebook to change uh, a little bit um, at this one layer removed. Thank you, Grant. Uh, so Senator Mefedrin, unfortunately, had to leave a bit early, so uh, we don't have her with us. But we we have posted uh, the online in the, the chat and in, in the group that the report to the Canadian All Party Group for the Prevention of Genocide about the role of technology in atrocity prevention or response. And there is an element on there about hate speech. So I, I think that'll be useful and to see if other um, parliamentarians around the world would look at that and see as something that they could push. Nationally, um, Miata, I'd like to ask you a specific question. I mean, so we've had different perspectives. You are in Myanmar. You've talked about one of the things that you think in the long term that has happened is a reform of education. Um, however, I'm wondering, as someone working in the digital space in Myanmar, um, what could 
what could NGOs, um, the UN do to support people like you and your colleagues to kind of uh, deal with this problem, uh, online hate, and, and is digital literacy uh, a component that you think needs to be brought up as well, despite the traditional educational reforms? Yes, we we need uh, like uh, that kind of digital literacy, but also that that uh, the re, uh, the re, the important most important thing from what I'm thinking, the most important thing is not just uh, digital literacy, a eh, and the other is media literacy is like uh, the long term solution. But right now, what we are facing is the crisis is ongoing. The, the, the bad actor, they are using the platform and then really well know about the platform and how to trick and how to cheat the platform. So the problem is the platform need to oh, invest for their like to to enforcement, not just about the policy level. So that kind of thing we are really needed, and also uh, not just like one platform. Now it's like a, we are facing the multi platform issue. Uh, the advocacy to Facebook is not just enough. We definitely need to do the 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 like a, if we want to solve the problem of hate speech, we definitely need to oh, ask the help from the like uh, we definitely need like uh, other platform like YouTube and TikTok. They also need to enforce their platform for to be to become uh, like a uh, uh, to become a uh, using a weaponized by the not stop being weaponized by the bad actor. So that kind of stuff. Uh, I think we are uh, we think that is really important thing. And also yeah, we also need uh, digital literacy and also the media literacy program for the whole country. And that kind of things are also should involve uh, as the primary. Uh, uh, like at the high school level, not just uh, uh, the advanced uh, tech uh, advanced thing. So that is like uh, my recommendation for the international community to do to do to do more, or how to say, uh, pressure on the tech company to 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 how to say to invest more on the high risk area like our country and the other. So they definitely need if the the tech company are uh, lack of contest lack of uh, the contest about the country and also lack of investment for the enforcement, that is really harm. So the, 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 the thing we facing in Facebook in 2017 is the same. You know, Facebook never care about the country. So they didn't like uh, we are small amount of group and also we are small amount of user and uh, we don't need the special treatment, but like uh, we are facing the ongoing genocide. So like uh, that kind of lack of investment are really harm to the, uh, the uh, our community and also we are facing the same on the YouTube, and they also need to change. So, yeah, I think like an international community need to like uh, how to say, as like a tech company to take more responsibility for their platform and also to uh, to to do more on their enforcement and uh, especially like investigation. Thank you, Miat. So we've almost come to the end, um, and we have Zoma uh, Pataleta, who's in Colombia, who's going to join us and show a graphic design of some of the discussions. So I'm gonna invite Zoma to come on in a minute. Um, I would just maybe like to take this uh, moment to thank Miat, to thank Grant, to thank Senator Mephedrin for taking time to share uh, your knowledge and your views on this. Um, we're really, I think on behalf of Gamak and Migs, um, just wanna say thank you. Uh, we hope to collaborate. Uh, and I'd like to tell the audience that also an important development is that the United Nations both the Office of, of the um, Special Advisor for the Prevention of Genocide um, and the and the High Commit and the and the Secretary General have issued a UN framework for hate speech, um, and there's a significant component on that that's also on the digital side. So I think there's a way for civil society organizations, governments to work with the UN in trying to operationalize this framework um, so that we'll see less of this hate online. That is increasingly the way of the future. Um, so with that to do, I would like to ask um, Zulma, we're going to invite Zulma to the stream. Uh, and we're going to try to add Zulma now. She's with us. Um, Zulma, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Miat and Grant. And um, uh, oh, we, we lost one of our panelists. Uh, but thank you for um, spending this time with us, sharing uh, with us this, this very horrendous and difficult situation. So I've tried to capture um, some of the key elements of the discussion um, in this image and in, in, in the way of this um, obscure connection that uh, happened and that 
cozy relationship between governments and, and tech giants. Um, together, the, the other uh, element that I heard very strongly um, was gender-based uh, prosecution. How those two things kind of interact or crossed um, to create um, this uh, horribly dramatic situation um, where sexual and gender-based attacks were justified. Um, so this, this, this intersection of these um, elements that uh, made this possible. Some of the, um, some of the um, key um, components, um, the anti-Muslim stereotypes, the anti-Muslim propaganda um, for that, that um, some of the examples were shared here that clearly uh, demonstrated how um, all of these messages were freely um, shared and, and amplified, I guess that's kind of the key um, element of being amplified um, through the use of, of social media platforms and the huge impact and in the way in which these um, clearly translated um, against um, women and, and girls and uh, pregnant women, um, everything that uh, caused um, and, and, and moved, I guess, from, from the screens um, to, to the physical world, um, having this um, huge impact uh, on the um, uh, Rohingya um, people. And perhaps um, there, is a, there was a, an element there in the discussion of responsibility. Um, like one, one idea is like, be, because of this cozy relationship between governments and tech giants, um, it's been really hard to, to do something that has been really effective because this has been going on for a long time. Um, and kind of the, the 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 actions that have been the measures so far from from tech giants, um, Facebook was obviously mentioned, but uh, as as it was said, it's 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 now moving from Facebook to YouTube to TikTok to all of, of the other um, social platforms, and kind of this idea of um, of of responsibility. How do you actually um, what is it? What is the legislation that that applies um, to these um, tech giants. Um, and then I was finishing here, or kind of continuing, this is obviously work in progress, um, but trying to also add some of the um, actions for what What then, what do we do about it? Um, and, and some of those ideas had to do with um, education um, and, and a regulatory framework. Um, and, and there were a couple more that I'll, I will add. Um, to the image. So I, I hope I've tried to to keep it um, to the central points of the discussion. And I really hope this can serve us as a tool to, to highlight some of these um, really horrendous um, situations. And it, and it can be a tool for continuing the conversation, summarizing some of these ideas and, and, and making it visible and clear uh, for the, for others um, towards uh, more more reflection and more action. Um, so with um, with these, I'll I'll pass it back to to Kyle. To you. <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you, Zolma, for this. Uh, so everyone, uh, once again, thank our speakers. It's a fascinating um, event, a fascinating subject, uh, something that we have to get smarter minds and work together on. Um, I think um, just to let you know that uh, this is the third of a fourth session on hate speech that Migs is doing with GIMAC. Um, we're going to organize one final one. I believe it's on December 8th. Um, and uh, we're going to have a bunch of GIMAC partners talk about what practically can be done um, now and into the future. And this is all part of the series is to lead up to GIMAC, to, to GIMAC's a major um, conference on hate speech that's set to take place in 2021 in The Hague. So so this is a, a be beginning of something. Um, it's not just theoretical, it's it's leading to more collaboration with GIMAX partners and other, um, other like-minded states, tech companies, and so forth. Um, so I just want to thank everyone. We're gonna post uh, uh, Zuma's um, graphic online in a, sh in a few days. We're gonna post the video, so please share with your colleagues. 
And please get in touch with Gamak and MIGS. I mean, Gamak's working on these issues. MIGS, we've been working on, on the digital side and hate. So we would love to continue this conversation long after this event and collaborate. So thank you very much.